Okay, we're ready. Okay. Well, okay, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. This evening, we're going to hear from three speakers who will discuss various aspects of supported decision making for individuals with a disability. I'm Sue Keisler, Executive Directors, Director of XMinds. And if you're unfamiliar with our organization, we're a volunteer driven nonprofit whose mission is to improve education for students on the autism spectrum. And we're based here in Montgomery County, Maryland. You can find out more about us at our website, xminds.org. And there we have a lot of great resources for parents of kids on the autism spectrum and also for teachers of students on the spectrum. Regular online speaker events like this one tonight are another way that XMinds reaches out to the community. So before we get to tonight's program, I wanna make sure everyone's aware of the next speaker event that we will have, which is gonna be on Wednesday, December 16th, and will be on the important topic of anxiety in students on the autism spectrum. One aspect of these monthly speaker events that I wanna make note of is that we're now including autistic voices in each of our events. We think this addition will enhance everyone's understanding of the subjects we address. So back to today. The order of tonight's program is, first you'll hear from Morgan Whitlatch. She's the legal director of the nonprofit Quality Trust for Individuals with Disabilities. And she will give us a great overview and practical advice about the full range of ways parents can support an adult with disabilities in Maryland. Then we'll hear from Adam Hoffman and his father, Howard Hoffman, who will tell us about their experiences using the principles of supported decision-making to help Adam make his own life decisions. I'm gonna let each of our speakers introduce themselves and then give their presentations. And after they've all had a chance to speak, we'll get to your questions, which you should feel free to post in the chat you know, at, at any time. I also wanna mention we are recording tonight's presentation and the recording along with the slides and a list of resources that Morgan Whitlatch has put together will all be posted on our website tomorrow. We're very grateful to Morgan, Adam and Howard for being here tonight and I'll turn it over to you now, Morgan. Thank you so much, Sue. So why don't we start with uh, putting up the PowerPoint presentation uh, and I can introduce myself a little bit. Um, as Sue indicated, uh, my name is Morgan Whitlatch and I am the legal director of Quality Trust for Individuals with Disabilities. And I really appreciate the invitation to join you, uh, Howard and Adam, for this webinar today. Um, I look forward to speaking to all of you about decision-making approaches available for families in Maryland who are or will be supporting young adults with disabilities. To share a little bit more about me, I'm an attorney. I'm licensed to practice law in Maryland and DC. And I've been practicing law now since 2002. I've spent the vast majority of my legal career working with and on behalf of people with disabilities. I'm really happy to be here with you today. So why don't we pull up the first poll, poll number one. I just wanted to gauge um, from the audience a little bit who, who's attending here. Um, so the first poll, uh, please let us know where you live. Maryland, I expect a lot of people live in Maryland, um, District of Columbia, Virginia, or other. Please take a moment to fill out this poll. Okay, we'll just give people another minute to fill out this poll and then we'll publish the results. Excellent. Okay, let's publish those results. Great. 89% uh, in Maryland. We have 5% in DC, uh, zero in Virginia, and 6% other or out of state. Excellent. Well, given what I knew about the um, work of XMinds, um, I'm not surprised that many of you are in Maryland. Um, for those who are not, I welcome you here today too. Uh, a lot about what we're going to be talking about today, including supported decision making, is relevant no matter what state you live in. Um, when we talk about specific legal tools, it's really important for me to let you know that the law that governs those does vary across states. Um, when it comes to state law issues. And when I talk about state law today, I'm focusing on Maryland law. Um, so if you live outside Maryland, the law in your state may be a little different. I encourage you to consult an attorney in your state if you wanna learn more about those legal tools and what the, how they work in your state. This presentation is for informational purposes only. It doesn't constitute legal advice. 
So now that I got all the disclaimers out of the way, I'm an attorney, we all have our disclaimers, right? Um, let's dive in. Next slide. So I wanna tell you a little bit more about Quality Trust uh, for Individuals with Disabilities, which is the organization that I work for, in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit advocacy organization, and we provide a variety of life-changing advocacy supports and resources. And when I speak about Quality Trust's work today, I'm gonna to focus on the services we offer to Maryland residents. So our mission is really to be an independent catalyst for change in the lives of people of all ages with developmental disabilities including autism. We partner with people and their families so that they can succeed, thrive, and experience full membership in the communities that they choose. And we do that in a variety of different ways. We're a unique organization in that we are interdisciplinary, meaning we have a team made up of developmental disability professionals, lawyers, nurses, family outreach specialists, self-advocates, uh, we work with individuals and families to solve problems and really figure out creative ways to make the most of everybody's abilities um, and right to be within the communities that they live in. We have a personal support services or PSS program that assists Maryland residents with disabilities and their families to plan and support an active, meaningful life in the community with individualized supports uh, provided by our professional team on a fee for service basis. Uh, Quality Trust also leads the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making, where I serve as the lead project director. Um, it's really a national hub of free resources for people with disabilities so that they can learn more about the right to make choices and their families can understand more about how supported decision making and other tools can be used to live self-determined lives of their choosing and we'll talk more about supported decision making a topic near and dear to my heart shortly next slide So one of the things I wanted to highlight was our Jenny Hatch Justice Project. Um, thanks to the funding of the WITH Foundation, we've undertaken a two-year healthcare decision-making initiative. Um, our legal team, as a consequence, can provide free legal advocacy to qualifying Maryland residents with developmental disabilities who need assistance in developing or enforcing legal tools for healthcare decision-making that are less restrictive than court-ordered guardianship. And our goal really is to make sure that people have access to the health care and resources that they need um, in this context. And it has become particularly uh, important during this pandemic. So I want you to be aware of our resources and that my contact information is on the final slide um, as well as on the resource list so that you can contact us with any questions that you may have after this presentation. Next slide. So here's kind of our to-do list for today. Um, it's a roadmap of where what I am going to be covering in my portion of the presentation. First, we're going to talk about what it legally means when a person with a disability turns 18. I know it can be an exciting but nerve-wracking time for families and a lot of questions about decision making and decision making rights tend to arise during this time. Next, we'll talk about what guardianship is for adults. And I find that many people have heard the term guardianship, but that there are some myths out there about what it means and how it works. So I'm gonna be seeking to dispel some of those. I truly believe that families need the information the full information um, about what options are so that they can make the right choice for them. Next, we'll talk about why uh, Quality Trust encourages families to think about other options first before turning to guardianship. And then finally, we'll talk about, again, one of my favorite subjects, supported decision making, the kind of what, why, and how of what this is, including some concrete examples of how it can work in healthcare. Next slide. So what happens when a person turns 18? In Maryland, the general rule is that the age of 18 is the age of majority. So a person becomes a legal adult when they turn 18. What does that mean? Well, regardless of whether or not they have a disability, the law presumes they get to make their own decisions now that they've turned 18. However, in Maryland, there's a big exception. I want to make sure people understand to this general rule, and it applies to adults, students, and special education. For those adult students, Maryland law says that their parents will generally get to continue to make special education decisions for them. And there are certain very limited circumstances where that's not the case. Um, it's usually when a parent has, is unavailable or uninvolved for some reason. 
um, but those are very narrow kinds of exceptions um, to that general rule. But other than with than special education decisions, when an adult with a disability in Maryland turns 18, they're presumed to be able to make other kinds of decisions. Next slide. So here is what I call the continuum of the main legal tools for decision making in Maryland. Um, these are for adults. This is not an exhaustive list because I'm sure you can think creative. There are a lot of new options that are available that are getting more traction like ABLE accounts and those kinds of things, but it's the main, the main list of tools um, to support decision making when someone turns 18. And the way it's organized is from the least restrictive at the top to the more restrictive on the bottom. So it represents a continuum. Think of it as like a toolbox of sorts. So each of these tools that are listed here may be needed under certain circumstances to support a person with a disability. But what we need to appreciate is that some of these tools are heavier than others when they're applied to a person. I found in my work that when an adult with a disability needs some support with decision making, there's a tendency for others to go too quickly down to the bottom of the list, namely to treat court-appointed guardianship as the default, particularly for people with developmental disabilities. And while there may be times guardianship is absolutely necessary, we need to recognize that it is the heaviest tool because of what it does to a person's rights. It really involves a court removing the rights of a person to act for themselves and to direct their own lives. And that's something all of us value um, so if what we're going to talk more about today, we really think it should be used as a last resort after the less restrictive options have been meaningfully explored and quality trust can be a resource for you in doing that. Since it's too frequently treated as a default, we'll just talk a little bit more about what guardianship is and I hope kind of dispel some of the myths associated with it. Next slide. So we'll pull up our second poll. What is guardianship? As I said, I think a lot of people have heard of that term guardianship for adults, and I'd like you to rate your familiarity. So on a scale of one to five, with five being the highest, how familiar are you with guardianship for adults? One is no knowledge, two is limited knowledge, three is some knowledge, four is general knowledge, and five is extensive knowledge. So if you could take a moment and fill in your selection now, please do. So again, we're rating on a scale of one to five, the familiarity that you have with the concept of guardianship. And I just wanna know a little bit, I think people have heard about guardianship before. Some people may be very familiar with it, others may not be. So please write your knowledge. Okay, let's post that. So we have no knowledge about 30%, so about you know a third, no knowledge, 27% have limited knowledge. 23 has some knowledge, 13 have general knowledge, and 4% have extensive knowledge. Okay, that's good to know. So let's talk a little bit about guardianship. We can close that poll and move on to the next slide. So what is guardianship? The first thing to recognize is guardianship is a formal legal process and it varies in terms of its processes and procedures across states. Um, but it's a legal process where a court determines whether an adult is what's called incapacitated or unable to make some or all of their own decisions. If the court makes that kind of determination, the court also has to evaluate, you know, what, whether or not someone else, whether court action is needed, someone else needs to be appointed to have a guardian. Um, and so I think that's a big piece of this is it's incapacitated, but it's also whether or not guardianship is necessary. Does the court need to intervene in these kinds of cases? Um, so that's the first piece of this. And we're going to talk more about shortly that guardianship means not only going to court, but you get a court order and it's going to be subjecting the guardian and the person to ongoing court oversight. Next slide. So I get lots of calls from parents saying that they need to get guardianship and I always ask them why because there are lots of myths about guardianship and sometimes guardianship is absolutely necessary to solve certain issues. Um, but what I want to take right now is to talk about some of the common myths that I hear about guardianship to dispel those for you. The first myth I hear is parents are automatically the guardian of their adult children with disabilities. Now, even though you've been caring 
for um, for your child, you know them so well, that's that's a myth, okay? All guardianships require going to court and getting a court order, no matter what a person's disability is or how it affects them. So when I get a call from a parent who tells me they are the guardian of their adult child, I always ask them if they have ever been to court. And if they haven't, then I know that they're not really the legal guardian. Guardianship really is defined by court order and law. So that's a big myth that I hear sometimes. Another myth that I hear frequently is that individuals who've been appointed a guardian over a minor child with a disability remain that person's guardian when the child becomes an adult. That's another myth, okay? So right now, today, we're gonna to be talking about adult tools. So we're talking about adult guardianship. Guardianship over children and guardianship over adults both require going to court and getting a court order, but they are different processes with different requirements and different kinds of court orders. Guardianships over minor child tend to end when the child becomes an adult, according to their state's law. Myth number three, parents need guardianship once their child becomes an adult to continue receiving the child's individualized education program, IEP, or other school records, as well as their child's services plans and medical records. This is a big myth that I hear. Um, an adult with IDD can sign a release of information form or authorization form allowing their parent to access some or all of their records. And as I said, when it comes to special education planning, the reality of the situation is, is that parents in Maryland are still regarded as the decision makers for special education students and the general rules. So one, when it comes to education planning, parents are the ones who exercise those kinds of special education rights even when their child turns 18, for as long as they remain in special education. But two, even with regard to healthcare records or other kind of non-special education records, an adult can sign a release form um, that would authorize their parent to continue to get those records. So you don't need to get guardianship for that piece of it. Another myth that I hear about is parents need guardianship once their child becomes an adult in order to attend planning meetings or medical appointments. That is also not the case. Um, any person can allow anyone, including their parent or other support person, to attend a meeting with them. Uh, it may require the signing of an authorization for release form, but um, parents can continue to be the person's supporters if that person wants them to be so. The fifth myth I hear uh, frequently is that guardianship will protect all people with disabilities from financial, physical, and other abuse. And unfortunately, Having a guardian in and of itself doesn't stop a person from give, giving others money or engaging in risky behaviors or getting arrested or being injured or taken advantage of. It can allow a guardian to take legal action on behalf of a person after that kind of abuse has occurred. But parents and other support people could also support the person with a disability to take their own legal action. And so I think the best way to prevent people with disabilities from being taken advantage of is to really educate and regularly communicate with them about safe choices, healthy relationships, and recognizing bad situations. Uh, so there's been no studies that have shown that people who are under guardianship are safer. It really is about safety planning and thinking through very carefully what are the kinds of support somebody needs to be able to live a safe, healthy, and self-determined life. Next slide. So why do we encourage people to think about other alternatives first um, from guardianship? As I said, sometimes guardianship is necessary. You'll never hear me not say that. I've been in situations where guardianship is absolutely the right choice for families, but you need to recognize that it does take away some or all of a person's rights to act for themselves, and that's a big step to take. The other piece that I think is really important for people to realize is that guardianship is more than a piece of paper. The court will become part of the guardian and the person's life going forward. What do I mean when I say that? There are reporting obligations that guardians have. There are, um, uh, the court could have additional hearings. If the court's unhappy with the guardian's actions, they could remove the guardian and replace them with someone else, a private guardian or potentially a public guardian. Um, so it really is important to realize that it's much more than a piece of paper. It really does mean court oversight. And I think families need to know that so that they go into it with their eyes open, knowing what their responsibilities are going to be. Guardianship can change relationships. I get a lot of 
calls from people who are deeply unhappy with their guardian. Um, they've also said, you know, people treat them different when they, differently when they learn that they're under guardianship. They step talking to them or involving them in decision making. Um, so the other big thing is that guardianship can take time and cost money. Now, whenever you involve the court system, this is true. It's important to realize, um, particularly in this time of COVID that has impacted a lot of court um, act uh, actions and operations, it can take time and cost money. And they can be very difficult to modify or terminate. Um, it's, even if a guardian resigns, that doesn't mean that the guardianship is over. Um, it means the court has to find another guardian. Um, so uh, I've worked with people who have tried for decades to get out of under guardianship. It can be very hard to, to try to show that the person should not have to be under guardianship. So it can be very difficult. And then finally, uh, they can be very difficult. They can, it, I really think decision-making is a learned skill. It's, you learn it by practice. It's a muscle that you have to be given the opportunity to be able to exercise over time. And so I encourage people to really realize that, uh, that piece of it, particularly for transition age youth. Next slide. So explore other alternatives first. And these are just a kind of little checklist to really think through, how do you find the right support? What's the decision that needs to be made? Can you undo the decision? What's the risks involved? Uh, has they ever made a decision like this before? Can it be challenged? And then really think, what's the least restrictive support that might work? And the reason why there's a puzzle here is because it really is about thinking about like, what is the decision? What's the healthcare decision that needs to be made? You might use a different tool for that versus for uh, uh, financial decisions. Um, it really is about piecing it together to use the right tool for the right decision for the right time. Next slide. And I encourage people to rethink what it means to be capa have capacity. And I put them in quotes because I don't really like the term. Capacity is not an all or nothing thing. It's not based solely on IQ or diagnosis. I've worked with many people who have intellectual disabilities who can sign powers of attorney knowingly and voluntarily to appoint someone to act for them. Um, I've worked with some people who can't. So it really is a much more kind of uh, nuanced way of thinking about it. Some people can make some decisions at some times and not others, sometimes only if they get the support they need um, to understand that kind of decision. And some people haven't had the opportunity to make decisions. And so you don't know whether or not they have the capacity. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit more about supported decision making. Um, again, here is our continuum of legal tools in Maryland. Um, and we're gonna focus on the first one, supported decision-making. And I wanna launch a poll after we go to the next slide that really kind of gauges um, people's familiarity with what supported decision-making is. Next slide. So please rate your familiarity with supported decision-making. One is no knowledge, two is limited knowledge, three is some knowledge, four is general knowledge, and five is extensive knowledge. So we'll give people a moment to rate their familiarity with that term, supported decision-making. Okay, great. Let's close that and the results, no knowledge. I'm not surprised, 56% people, which is more people than for guardianship are not familiar with what supported decision-making is and you're not alone. Supported decision-making really is a, a newer term and so we're gonna talk more about it and I bet you've been practicing it even though you haven't called it that. Um, two is limited knowledge was 19%, three is some knowledge is 15%, general knowledge is 8% and 1% is extensive knowledge. Okay, so let's talk about what supported decision making is. Next slide. Well, I think supported decision making actually is human decision making. Um, it, we all do it every day. Nobody makes decisions in a vacuum. What do we do? We use our support networks. Um, we use our support networks to get information we need, um, to help understand the issues and choices that we have faced to ask questions, to actually receive explanations in ways that we understand, to communicate those decisions to others. So if I have to make a healthcare decision, guess who I call? I call my sister. Now she's a doctor, so I'm the lawyer, she's the doctor, okay? But more importantly, um, she ha has known me all my life because we're twins. Basically, since I've been born, uh, since I've been born, she's known me well. She knows my 
preferences. She knows what I care about when it comes to healthcare. She knows my quirks. So I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac. She knows how to say things to me in ways that aren't going to freak me out. Okay. And we talk it through and I make a decision. And when I do that, people say I'm, a, I'm making a wise decision. But sometimes when people with disabilities need little, a little help or time or more help and time or different kinds of help to think through decisions, people think they can't make the decisions at all. And so I think supported decision making reminds us that we have to give people with disabilities the time to kind of process being able to get the, their questions answered in ways they understand too, just like we all do. So that's why we give it a special name for supported decision making, but let's demystify supported decision making. Next slide. So the first issue that I get with supported decision making is people tell me, Morgan, I can't use supported decision making. It's not available in my state because we don't have a supported decision making law. And this is false. Okay. Supported, you know, some states have taken the steps to actually pass supported decision making legislation that formally recognizes as an option, like a power of attorney legislation or like guardianship legislation. Um, a number of states have done that, um, but you don't need to do that in order to recognize what supported decision making is. What I've always said is that supported decision making should be viewed through the lens of an accommodation for someone's disability. Um, and we have the America with Disabilities Act and the Rehab Act uh, as well to be able to support people's right to be reasonably accommodated by third parties. And this is accommodating them in decision making. So you don't need to have a law change to use supported decision making. The second piece is people, I've heard a lot that people with intellectual disabilities somehow don't have the capacity to be able to use supported decision making. And that is also false. You can't make presumptions based on certain diagnoses that people can't make their own decisions with support. I encourage people to think of it more capacity is much more nuanced than that, like we talked about. I've worked with people who have had low IQs who could use supported decision making. Um, I've worked with people who have certain psychiatric diagnoses who could use supported decision making. So let's think differently about what supported decision making is in terms of decision. They may need more support in understanding decisions or in ways in which they're explained to them, but they're not automatically precluded from using supported decision making simply because they have an intellectual disability. Next slide. Let's so we talked about the, uh, I'm sorry, previous slide. Um, so when, when we're talking about the myths of supported decision making, the other piece I wanted to talk about was to demystify supported decision making is that somehow just supported decision making is less safe than guardianship. And it's not true. There have been no studies that have shown that it's less safe. Instead, you need to think about what are the safeguards that you're building in to supported decision making. How, what kind, what, do, what does support networks look like? How can they serve checks and balances against each other to check on somebody? So keep that in mind when we think about the myths of supported decision making. Next slide. Now we talked about the what of supported decision making. Let's talk about the why. So when we talk about the why of supported decision making, why are we promoting this? It really comes down to self-determination. And what does that mean? It means life control. It means you have the ability to be an agent in your own lives, to actually act rather than being acted upon. And studies, decades and decades of studies have shown people with disabilities with greater self-determination are more independent, they're more integrated into their communities, they're healthier, and they're better able to recognize and resist abuse. And you'll see those studies are cited in your resource list, so you know I'm not making it up. There have been decades and decades of studies that have shown promoting self-determination leads to better life outcomes for people with disabilities. Next slide. And when people are denied self-determination, you can feel helpless and hopeless and self-critical and have low self-esteem, passivity, and feelings of inadequacy or incompetency, and worse life outcomes. So there's two sides to this coin that really say why we should be promoting self-determination. Next slide. Studies have also shown that students who have self-determination skills are more likely to successfully make that transition to adulthood. And we know that can be a bumpy transition, but studies have shown that when you're promoted to have self-determination and build those skills over time as a student, you're gonna have improved education, employment, and independent living outcomes. And that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who don't have a guardian are more likely to live in their own homes, be included in the community, have their rights respected, actually have job goals, um, be support to communicate with friends, and being involved to make choices in their own lives. Next slide. 
Now, how do you do it? People want a checklist from me. They're always asking for a checklist, but I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna look different for everybody. You're gonna hear soon about how Adam uses supported decision-making, and I've seen people use formal options, informal options, there's no one size fits all. You really have to ask yourself, what are their goals? What help do they need? Who do they wanna give them that kind of help? How do they want that help to be given? and what will it take to make their own decisions with support. So there's no one size fits all. I have some wonderful brainstorming tools about supported decision making included in your resource list. And I hope you'll take a look. Next slide. Here's the toolbox I consider for supported decision making here. The first piece of this is effective communication. Now, if I wanna say when I talk about communication, I'm not talking about supported decision making is only for people who communicate with words. There are many different ways to communicate and there's a guide in your resources that talks about how everyone communicates and how to support them in communication. Um, but you need to figure out ways of, of promoting the person to be able to communicate, whether that be through assistive technology, whether that be through gestures, whether it be through other kinds of communication techniques, communication is key to supported decision making. Um, I've seen people use very formal supports like team based approaches, um, documents that are signed, and very informal support approaches. Um, I know people who use supported decision making every day and they don't have signed papers. Um, I see a real role for peer support and there's some great videos that show how people with disabilities use supported decision making in their lives that are included in your resource pages. So please take a look. Um, one of the biggest things on this list I really say is really about respectful environments that are welcoming to people. That's a really big key. I think thinking through how to treat people respectfully, to listen to them and to challenge ourselves to think about how people communicate is really key. And technology has become all the more important during this time of COVID. Next slide. Here are some more kind of tools for supported decision making. Um, we have here some written documents. Um, I'm a lawyer. Hey, I like paper. Okay. Um, I have sometimes seen the word, if I ask for a show of hands about who's heard of HIPAA, I'm sure I would see a lot of them. That's the health privacy law. Okay. Um, I've, used, I've seen HIPAA used as a kind of weapon against supported decision making and people with disabilities getting support to make their own decisions. And that can be easily solved with a HIPAA release form. What is the amount of capacity you need to sign a HIPAA release form? It's very low. Remember I told you capacity is a continuum. So it's, I want this person to get confidential information about me. It's a lower level. They're usually a one page form. Um, and so I think that's, they can be very easy tools here. And as I said, we have some great supported decision-making guides and you have the America with Disabilities Act on your side. Next slide. So let's talk about healthcare. Um, and some examples, concrete examples of how to use supported decision making in healthcare. I put here um, the different Maryland tools that can be used to support people um, short of guardianship and healthcare. And you see I put supported decision making. Um, Maryland's advanced directive is really the healthcare power of attorney uh, kind of form for mental health and healthcare decisions. Um, that's an option and there's a link to that form. Um, that's a voluntary way in which someone can appoint an agent to act for them in certain circumstances. And then if someone can't sign a power of attorney and can't use supported decision making and get certain certifications from the physicians that they can't make healthcare decisions, there's something called surrogate decision making that doesn't require you to get guardianship. Um, so those, those are very important options that are explained more in a guide that has been put into your materials in the resource list. So I hope you'll take a look at that guide. It's called Guardianship and Alternatives. Next slide. So as I said, for supported decision-making healthcare, release forms are great. They can really kind of allow the information to flow for people. Um, and I've seen that used very successfully to promote supported decision-making in healthcare. I've also used the American with Disabilities Act to support that. You know, doctors should not make presumptions about people's decision-making skills and ability to give informed consent simply because of a certain kind of diagnosis. Um, reasonable accommodation should be alive and well um, in using that. Um, and so I really encourage people to use that creatively. Um, we really do also want to promote the use during, particularly during COVID-19. There's been some visitor bans in hospitals um, and issues with people who need to have a supporter in order to get access to quality health care on an equal basis to, as other people who live in Maryland and other areas. Um, and so there is in your um, resource list guidance that Maryland has issued, the Department of Health has issued, that has described a person's right to a support person in the hospital, even with COVID-19 visitor bans. 
And Maryland's actually passed a law on supported decision making. Um, it's limited to organ transplantation, but it recognizes supported decision making as an accommodation for someone's disability within a medical context. And I think it really, you know, kind of evidences that it is an accommodation for someone's disability. Finally, you know, not all uh, medical decisions are the same. I think we need to think differently about that. So compare, for example, getting a blood draw. In other words, getting tested a blood draw or a COVID test or that, something like that with having open heart surgery. They're very different decisions. The surgery is a much more complicated decision than having a blood draw, which has risks and benefits, but not to the same degree as surgery. So we really need to think about capacity differently when we think about um, getting informed consent for healthcare. Next slide. And there's some tools I included about this, particularly uh, focusing on healthcare. Um, there's this really great tool, the blood draw tool that was done by Cho uh, My Choice Kentucky. And I highlight that because it kind of communicates by pictures on um, how to do this. It's focused on one kind of medical decision to talk about the supported decision-making process for blood draw. It includes a video. It, it's a very interesting, innovative kind of tool for how to describe things. Um, I sometimes think that visuals are underutilized when we think about informed consent for um, care, uh, healthcare, and it gives a really concrete example of how to have conversations with doctors and people with disabilities about, a, about medical decisions. There's also tools from the ARC of the United States, a letter to my doctors. It really talks about how people, how document how a person with a disability wants to be supported um, when they work with their doctor. Um, and then there's also some good to do checklists for people about how to do healthcare and how to help support people learn how to build decision making skills over time um, that have been created by the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. And all of those resources are linked um, into your resource page. And I encourage you to take a look. There's also some great videos that talk about concretely how to do supported decision making in healthcare that you might also find interesting. Next slide. In conclusion, you know, everyone has a right to make choices. Um, and I really encourage you to think through um, how to support people in building capacity to make decisions over time. That doesn't just happen when someone turns 18. You're not just magically able to make decisions, okay? It's about thinking, how can I incorporate decision-making skills into how, how people are supported beginning really early? So I think a great, you know, you're gonna hear some great examples, I think, from Howard and Adam. But I would say, you know, I think that education advocacy needs to occur um, beginning in pre-K, um, where you're incorporating into IEP goals that say how to build self-determination skills over time, how to promote people being able to engage in their decision making, having people be involved in their IEP team meetings early so they don't just get exposed to this when they turn 18. Um, those are some concrete examples about how you can build skill building over time using the special education process. Uh, next slide. So you later will be able to ask me some questions, um, but I'm really happy right now to turn this over to Howard and Adam. Okay, yeah, I, I guess, um, thank you very much, Morgan. And uh, there are some questions in the chat and we'll just hold on to them until after we've heard from Howard and Adam. Um, so now we're gonna hear from Howard and Adam Hoffman. Howard? Thanks, uh, thanks Sue. Uh, I'm Howard Hoffman. Uh, I'm Adam's dad. I live in Bethesda. I work for the federal government. Uh, I work in the environmental field and I like to tell people that I am hopeful that soon my job will become great again. Uh, many thanks to the Partnership for Extraordinary Minds, which is a marvelous organization. Uh, a tip of the cap to Laura Gordon, Sue Kaiser, uh, Jean Weingartner and company, and special thanks to Melissa Egan, who put a great deal of time and effort into organizing this program. Uh, Adam and I are delighted to be here, uh, and we're happy to share our experience with supported decision making uh, in the hopes that we can give you folks uh, a little, a few more data points uh, about it. Um, so uh, for the next uh, uh, 20, 30 minutes, Adam and I are going to be something of a tag team. Uh, in a moment, Adam will say a little bit about himself, uh, including decisions that he makes day to day, and then a, a big decision he had to make in the past few months, where he moved from one apartment building in downtown Rockville called the Fenestra to another apartment building in Rockville called Main Street. And then after his presentation, I'm going to 
take the, take the baton back and I'm going to say a few words from a parent's perspective uh, about supported decision making and we will then go from there. So uh, Adam, uh, please go ahead. So my name is Adam Hoffman, for those of you who don't know, and here's some information about myself. I'm 32 and have high functioning autism. I was born and grew up in Bethesda, Maryland. When growing up, I mostly went to private schools like the Laurie Center and the Catherine Thomas School. The high schools I attended were the Harbor School in Owens Mills and Catherine Thomas School in Rockville. I graduated high school in 2008 when I was almost 20 years old. I've been driving since I was 16 and now have my own car. I started Montgomery College in 2008 and graduated with an associate's degree in 2013. My major was Computer Applications Information Technology. I had a part-time office job at Convergence in Virginia when I was in college and for two years afterwards. For about 10 months, from 2014 to 2015, I had an internship at National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, which was part of Project Search, a program to help people with disabilities get jobs. My internship at NIH turned into a full-time job starting in the spring of 2015. Now I work at the Center of Information Technology, which is part of NIH. I do clerical and administrative work. I have faxed sheets with people's signatures, delivered mail around the office, done inventory on supplies, given people supplies when needed, made copies of required things, and added paper to, you know, copy machines, copy printer machines. On the NIH campus, I've set up new phones and put signs on old ones. Now I work at home and have entered in Excel how many times people's names appear under dates. I lived with my parents until I started going to Montgomery College in Rockville. I moved into an apartment building near Montgomery College. I lived with a roommate and got living support from an organization called College Living Experience, which helps people with disabilities go to Montgomery College and live independently. I lived in an apartment near there, Montgomery College, for eight years with a roommate and then moved to my own apartment in Finestra, which is an apartment building in downtown Rockville. I lived there by myself for two years. This past summer, I moved to my own apartment in another building in downtown Rockville named Main Street. I make lots of decisions by myself every day. Once a week, I go grocery shopping and pick what I'm interested in buying. I choose what foods to cook on certain days. I've occasionally bought food online I buy my own clothes, sometimes in a store and other times online. I make appointments myself, like go to the dentist twice a year, see my doctor once a year for a checkup, get a haircut, see my psychologist once a week, and participate in a guys group led by a social worker once a week. I decide what social activities and get-togethers I'm interested in, and I schedule them. I see a mentor once a week, and we talk about what social activities I want to do. I'm involved in a group called Integrated Living Opportunities, which is abbreviated ILO, I-L-O, which helps people with disabilities live independently. On Wednesdays, I meet in Gaithersburg with ILO members once a week. I also do Zoom meetings with Rockville ILO members some Wednesdays. Other Wednesdays, I do Zoom meetings with a group from Jubilee, an organization that helps people with disabilities. I occasionally get together with friends. The building I now live in, Main Street, has social activities, and I pick which ones I want to go to. Recently, earlier this year, I had a big decision to make about where to live. Two years ago, I moved to Finestra, which again is an apartment building in downtown Rockville. I liked it and knew a couple of people who lived there. I heard about Main Street building its building and applied for it. Main Street's an apartment building in downtown Rockville that's designed to support people with disabilities. When I got accepted there, Main Street, I wasn't sure I wanted to move there. First, I thought I wanted to stay in Finestra because I was used to it. Talked to my family, therapist, mentor, and others and thought about pros and cons. I walked over to Main Street while it was being built to see what it looked like and looked at pictures of what it would look like when being built. The pros of moving there outweighed the cons. I know more people in Main Street than I knew before and have enjoyed seeing them. So with the help of people who support me, I decided to make the move. Okay, thanks, 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 Adam. No problem. All right, now I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, about a 
parent's perspective on supported decision making. Um, the, uh, the autism spectrum is, of course, quite broad. Uh, with, uh, with Adam, I think you see one version, which is, which is probably towards the high, the high functioning end. Um, and, and it's probably the case that supported decision making, as, as opposed to a guardianship, is an, is an easier call in this situation. But the, uh, the decision making arrangement that Adam has is still qualified in certain respects. Um, his, his parents retain certain legal authorities. Um, um, so one is uh, a power of attorney for making medical decisions if he becomes incapacitated. Uh, a second is whenever he sees a physician or a doctor, he signs a HIPAA form so that his parents have the right to talk to his doctors. Uh, and then the third is, is his parents have a power of attorney for financial matters, like uh, handling the disability benefits he receives from the state of Maryland, which are really complicated. Uh, in practice, Adam signs all the documents, but I, uh, like I say, his parents have a, have a power of attorney over that. Um, let me say a few words about the benefits of supported decision making. Um, there are many benefits to the person uh, uh, and, and Morgan uh, uh, described, described them. And I think a lot of them would be, uh, would be commonsensical to, uh, to parents. Uh, let me point out an, an additional one, which is it is easier for a person to accept the consequences of a decision if it, doesn't, if it does not work out, work out as hoped for, if that person made the decision themselves. So a familiar example um, uh, uh, is one involving uh, our neurotypical children. Uh, in, our in our community, we often send our, our neurotypical high school graduates off to college, and we usually let them pick the college they want to go to, uh, uh, you know, perhaps within broad constraints. Uh, even though your typical 17, 18 year old really has very little basis for picking out a college. Right, you know, urban versus suburban or country, big or little, you know, there's not much really in a 17 year old's experience which would really inform, inform such a decision. And parents usually figure that out when the kid keeps changing her mind every week or so. Um, but a benefit of, of allowing the child to make the decision of, of what school to go to is that if the kid ends up not liking the choice and, and finds herself not, not, not being that happy her freshman year, she has to come to terms with that herself. Uh, she can't blame her parents for that one. Um, and that, that's a really, really useful um, thing to happen and it's a really useful process to go through. Hold on. Um, the same oh, good. Okay, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you so much. Let me, let me just ask everybody to be sure to stay muted. <laughs> Thanks. Now, the same is true um, through a different prism for, for decisions made by people with intellectual disabilities. It's, 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 it's easier for them to accept the consequences of a decision if they have gone through the process of making the decision and can say to themselves, well, on some level, you know, I made the decision myself. Um, so another benefit of supported decision making is that it is good for the parent's peace of mind. Uh, it is hard to make a decision for another person. Uh, I, I am sure that many of you uh, with younger children agonize over what school your child should go to. Uh, we found those kinds of decisions did not get easier as our child got older. In fact, they get harder. Uh, decisions about what kind of job to apply for, what kind of living arrangement, where to live, uh, those kinds of decisions, those are the kinds of decisions that get harder over time. Having the person make the decision themselves gives the parent some degree of peace of mind. You can say to yourself, well, I may not have, this may not have been my first choice, but this is what they wanted to do. And the parent's peace, for my, peace of mind, if I say so myself, does count for something. Uh, a third benefit of supported decision making is that it is consistent with our culture. Uh, in our society, we want our children to be independent, and we, and we often want them to live independently. To go back to a, a, an earlier example, most neurotypical 17, 18 year olds will, will probably not lightly accept having their parents tell them what college to go to. And I, I think a similar dynamic, although through a different prism, but still similar, happens with many people with intellectual disabilities, especially as they move through adulthood. Um, now, let, let me say a few words about the support part of supported decision-making. Um, th th this is just one, uh, 
one 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 aspect of it that that is 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 worth pointing out. I think uh, decision making can be very hard, uh, and often the decision is whether to make a change from what you are currently doing, uh, and to decide whether to, to 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 do something different. So to decide whether to make that change, you need to envision the future. Uh, and this can be really challenging. Adam described a, different, a difficult decision he had to make recently. He was living in a nice apartment, in a nice building, in a nice part of town. He was quite content with that. Uh, along came a, a unique opportunity, really, a chance to move into another apartment building that is uniquely supportive of people with disabilities. So that was a really hard decision. Uh, particularly if you're if you're the kind of person who tends to uh, who tends to think a bit concretely, so one of the things Adam's supporters did uh, was to uh, uh, help paint a picture of what the future would look like if he decided to move, uh, and I think that information turned out to be turned out to be really valuable. Um, so let me say a few words about how families can make the decision. Uh, uh, to use supported decision making, um, it's 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 it, it, it may not be an easy decision because it is forward looking. Um, that's because, and I'm talking from the perspective of of parents who have children younger than 18. Um, it, it's 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 it, it's difficult because parenting always seems to be so focused on the present. Right, we, we cannot easily remember what our children were like when they were younger, and we cannot easily imagine them being older. However, as your child approaches 18, and you start to come to terms with this issue of decision making, you do have to imagine the child as a young adult, uh, as a 30 something, as a middle aged adult, and so on. So that's, that's pretty hard to envision. And, and things are not likely to turn out the way you thought once you try to envision it. And obviously, of course, it's going to depend on the person, as Morgan said. But let me suggest that a way to approach it is, and, 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 and this, I think, coincides with, with, with some of the things Morgan said, is for the default to be planning for supported decision making, if that is at all in the picture. And as you get closer, if it turns out that's not workable, then you can go to, go to something more restrictive. Um, let me say a few words about tools that parents can use to, to uh, support, uh, to prepare for supported decision making. And, and, and again, Morgan had a very nice list of, of things families can do. To me, the things that caught my eye on that list uh, in particular were actually the first two. Uh, the first was communication. Um, uh, this is obviously a good thing to do uh, 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 to promote communication with your child for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and so far as supported decision making is concerned, the more you establish a habit of communication, the more likely it is that supported decision making will work because you, the parent, will be a big part of the support. Uh, and making and in 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 develop in in communicating, making decisions of any kind with your child are a great thing to communicate around, from picking out a movie on Netflix to deciding where to go on vacation once we get to the point where we can go somewhere on vacation. Uh, and involving your child in, in any of these decisions are great avenues for communication because everybody's motivated. Um, it, it, is, it is hard to do that, you know, among all the chaos that always seems to be part of our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, in our family, looking back, we did not do it nearly as much as, as we would have liked, um, but it's, it's still a really good goal. To, uh, to strive for. And then uh, a second thing, and this I think was the second thing on Morgan's list, is, is to start thinking about or start putting supports in place um, um, you know, as soon as you can, as you, as you, as you approach the, uh, this, this age of 18. Um, you know, in another time and place, when families were bigger and everyone lived nearby, there were more siblings and aunts and uncles and cousins around, uh, it was probably not as necessary to have supports outside the family. Um, in Adam's case, in addition to his small nuclear family uh, who was in this area, um, he does have some significant supports in place, uh, and many of them have been longstanding. And he, he alluded to some of them, and I'll, I'll mention them again. Um, um, he sees a psychotherapist once a week, uh, who, who fortunately is a preferred provider under his insurance plan. 
Um, as he mentioned, he goes to a guys group uh, once a week. That's a group of six or seven young men uh, led by a social worker. They talk about guy stuff. Uh, uh, and the fees for that are partly reimbursed by insurance. Um, once a week, he sees a mentor who helps him with his social calendar. And, and, and I'll mention that the fees for that are paid for by his Maryland state disability benefits which he's eligible for because he receives Medicaid. In Maryland, that's called medical assistance. And he gets Medicaid because he's eligible for the Social Security SSI program, which is one of Social Security's disabilities programs. Adam mentioned that he's employed. He has a job coach who, who, who is in touch with him on a weekly basis. That, that, that also is paid for by the Maryland State Disability Benefits. He's a member of this, of this marvelous organization, Integrated Living Opportunities, which he mentioned, which uh, supports adults with disabilities living independently. Uh, and part of the costs for that are also paid for by his Maryland State Disability Benefits. Um, and he, he's also a member of Main Street, which is also a housing support organization for adults with disabilities, and which, which is a low cost organization. So when you add it all up, um, that, that is a lot. That is a lot of supports. Uh, I doubt that all of Adam's friends have all of the, have all of those things, but many have some of them. There were there were many reasons outside of supported decision making to set them up, um, but they have proven to be quite helpful uh, when it has come time to make a big decision. Um, uh, now, I wanted to be sure to mention the financial side of things. Um, the financial, including the financial benefits that pay for at least part of the costs of the supports. Um, uh, from, 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 from a parent's standpoint, it is not easy to figure out and get signed up for um, those financial benefits, which, which, which are often available, not always, but often available. Uh, Social Security disability benefits, in, in Adam's case, that's SSI, uh, Medicaid, the Maryland disability benefits. Um, they're, they're, they're difficult to wrestle with, but I strongly encourage you to pursue them vigorously. Uh, you will be glad you did for years and years to come. Um, so the last point I want to make is, um, so you have a young adult who is their own decision maker. Uh, uh, they're, they're, you, you all have signed up for supported decision making. What is left for you, the parent, to do? Uh, well, the answer is plenty, don't worry. My parents would have told you that parenting is lifelong. That will be the case for you too, I promise. Uh, so specifically, just to bring it back to, to our family, uh, at this point, one of our jobs as Adam's parents is basically to do some research, uh, to figure out some choices uh, for things li little or big, whether they're social activities, sports, ways to keep busy during pandemics, uh, places to live, things related to employment, you know, whatever. Uh, we are always, you know, uh, 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 coming across things from, from, from whatever sources and we'll pitch them at Adam if we think that they're useful. He will decide uh, what he wants to do. Um, we, we parents will often have definite views. Uh, we'll try to talk him into it if we can. Uh, I, am, I am most certainly not above engaging in the usual parental manipulations. Uh, we have access to his supporters, uh, so on big ticket items, we can try to round up a posse, uh, but, but his supporters see themselves uh, correctly as advocates for Adam, so there are some limits there. But in our case, uh, the fact that most of his uh, supporters are long-standing, he's been, he's been seeing the same folks for, for, for quite some time, uh, that, that helps a lot. We, we, all, we all tend to see things the same way. Uh, so beyond his supporters, we, we parents stay in touch with his physicians. Uh, we check in with him after appointments. Uh, we have access to the patient portals uh, uh, and so on. Uh, but but I, I have to say, all of this is still a work in process. Uh, there are some things we, we have not really figured out. Um, like if, if heaven, heaven forbid, there is a serious illness, but not an incapacitating illness. So he, he would retain the, the decision-making authority. There could be lots of choices about medical care, which, which could be com complex, and, and, and what happens then? So like I say, we're, this is a work in process. So, so let me stop there, and I want to say thank you again to the Extraordinary Minds Partnership folks. And at this point, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the baton back to Adam and to uh, Sue, and I understand that Sue has some, uh, some questions for Adam. 
So Adam, you can unmute and put your, put your screen back on. So thanks again very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Howard. It's, and Adam too, I mean, for sharing all this, these personal experiences. It's so, it's so great for the rest of us to hear what your experience has been. It's just invaluable. Um, actually, I was going, I had prepared questions for Adam, but Adam, you, you spoke so beautifully before and you really covered everything that I wanted to ask you. So I thought maybe we could just move at this point into the questions from the chat. And Laura Gordon, uh, board president of XMinds, is has been monitoring the chat and she can take over those questions. Thanks. Yep. Um, so Morgan, you probably were, were peeking at the chat too. Um, so the, the first probably uh, six or seven questions are gonna be probably directed to you. Um, the first one I got was a private question about um, the difference between guardianship of a trust versus the guardianship you're talking about. I think there was some, there was some confusion about oh, if, okay. what, what guardianship meant. In, in, in Maryland, there are, yeah, that's a really good question. Really good question. And it varies by state, okay? Um, there are two different kinds of guardianship in Maryland. There's something called guardianship of the person which is over everything except for significant financial assets. And there's guardianship of the property, which is usually for people who have more significant kind of assets. You could be guardian of the property, you could be guardian of the person, or you could be guardian of both. That's how Maryland law works when it comes to this. So you may, when you say that, you might be talking about guardian of property. You also might be talking about a trust. Okay, so a trust is another kind of tool, it's actually an alternative to guardianship, with, that can look very different. So there are things that are called pooled special needs trusts, there are things that are called special needs trusts that are standalone, um, there are many different kinds of trusts, and, the, and they're managed by somebody called a trustee. Um, and so that, that's another option other than guardianship as well. Um, I'm happy to talk to you offline if you have any other kind of further questions about how those kinds those kinds of tools work. Very good question, though. Right, and that's yeah, and that's a reminder, you guys. We will be sending um, a follow up email with with all this information, um, the the presentation, Morgan's contact information. So just so you know, um, you'll be getting all that in an email um, within the next day or so. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, the next question was, how difficult is it to reverse a guardianship, even if everyone's on the same page, like everyone agrees, mm -hmm. like, yep, this wasn't what we should have done. How, how does that happen? So it can be quite difficult. So I've been involved in cases, for example, where the guardian agreed that the person didn't need to be under guardianship anymore. They were a, par they were a parent who'd actually gotten guardianship over someone when they turned 18 because they thought that's how you had to get services. And it, it, it wasn't a good fit for them. Guardianship wasn't a good fit. They said, you know, we use supported decision-making in the guardianship, which is something you can use those principles within the guardianship. This person can make their own decisions. And, um, and they, it, it, they weren't able to, even though they agreed, the person agreed, the court didn't agree. Um, because you have to show that the person no longer is incapacitated in order to get a guardianship removed or that an alternative to guardianship will work. And so the court's going to ask you, what has changed? So, well, you, you know, the diagnosis probably isn't going to have changed, right? You're going to have to kind of show evidence. And unless you show that evidence, um, it can be very difficult to get from a guardianship. I really do recommend people talk to an attorney about how to approach that if they're looking to terminate a guardianship. Because if you don't come in that way, I've, I've seen people go in and leave with more guardians than they came into. <laughs> because they didn't have the kind of legal advice that you need to really show a good case. Um, courts don't like to be told they're wrong, right? Oh, you made a mistake, guardianship isn't needed. Instead, you have to show what's changed. How can this person be supported without guardianship? Very good question, very good question. Yeah, yeah that is a good one. Um, uh, this question we kind of talked about sort of bef when we were planning the webinar, someone at, it was asking is, um, is the supported decision making a, a legal thing mm -hmm. or is it a series of just informal practices that you do? So it is a legal thing. As I said, I think it's an accommodation for people's disabilities so I can connect it to something in the law. 
Um, but it also is, it could be very informal. It could just, I think people use supported decision making every day without any kind of plan or agreement. They just kind of do that kind of planning together and, and, and discussions together, or it can be more formalized um, in the sense that you say, okay, um, uh, you know, this person's going to support me in this kind of way, this person's going to support me in another way, and you document everything so everybody knows. So it can really vary, but I really want to encourage people that, you know, myth of supported decision making is that somehow it's not an official thing. It can be very official, and it can also be very informal. So I, it really depends upon what the person's needs are. And to be honest with you, you know, about third parties' willingness to accept it. So for me, the benefits to formalizing supportive decision making is just to make sure that you're kind of uh, able to enforce it um, by showing it's documented. Um, that's, the, that's the benefit I see to formalizing uh, supportive decision making. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, you sort of touched on this already actually in the answer to the other question, but the question was um, getting at does guardianship preclude supported decision making if we're, you know, why is it important if we get if we get guardianship and we're just using the supported decision making model anyway. Like, what is the benefit of not getting guardianship like if in practice we're just doing it anyway, sort of, sort of a reverse of what you were just talking about. Right. Supported decision-making principles can absolutely and should be used within guardianship. People with disabilities who are under guardianship should be involved by their guardians in decision-making and best practices by the National Guardianship uh, uh, Association says that you should be using supported decision-making before guardianship and within the guardianship um, so that people can build skills over time and hopefully eventually maybe you'll be able to determine or limit the guardianship. So you're absolutely right that supported decision-making principles can be used within guardianship. But supported still within guardianship, you think about who is the one signing on the dotted line. It's not the person with the disability, right? It's the guardian who makes the final decision. The guardian can be doing everything they should be doing by supporting the person be, to be involved in the decision-making process, taking into account the person's wishes, et cetera. But the person with the disability still is not making the official de decision. So there is a distinction. Um, even though supported decision-making principles can and should be used within guardianship, there is a distinction. Gotcha. Okay. I'm um, circling back. Sorry, just a little bit to the other question. We were just talking about formal formalizing the supported decision making. Can you give a quick example of what that might look like in Maryland? Like Absolutely. In Maryland. Yeah. Sure. So I've helped people kind of develop a supported decision making agreement where um, they kind of describe how they're going to support somebody. Um, and then I've linked it to accommodations for your disability um, it, to kind of make it look almost like a request for accommodation uh, for doctors. And so that's one kind of creative way of doing it since Maryland is not one of those states, unlike DC, that has actually developed a supported decision-making agreement form in their statute. So I've used it that way. I've also just used, uh, you know, a fancy HIPAA release form for a doctor that says, you know, uh, that's what they did in Maine before they passed a law was they kind of fancied up a HIPAA form. And, you know, uh, you know, at some, we provided some technical assistance to them in doing that. And it's like, that's, that's the legal document you need. You really just need the information to flow. Another thing we've done too, is that we've taken what, you know, Howard mentioned this, right? You mentioned a springing power of attorney for healthcare. In other words, that goes into effect and allows an agent to act for the person with, in this case, with a disability, if that person's determined not to be able to make healthcare decisions themselves. And we have an example on our supporteddecisionmaking.org website where we took a kind of a, a form like that and said, made it a supported decision-making agreement language in it, saying that, yes, this, my, my, my uh, parent can't make decisions for me until and unless I can't make those healthcare decisions myself, but until then, I want them to support me. And look, here's an attached HIPAA form. So we kind of fancied up a power of attorney to make it look, uh, to make it be able to support supported decision-making principles. So there are lots of different creative ways of trying to document and formalize supported decision-making. And it looks different for every person. As I said, it's a very individualized approach. Okay, so if someone, want maybe didn't have a will or trust that outlined sort of um you know what happens when so and so passes could they use the supported decision making um sort of formalization as a way to sort of um say uh, you know i want these people to be um, my supporters and if those supporters can't do it 
um, can these supporters step in, like sort of like a succession? Like, have you seen anything like that where um, you're sort of formalizing who the supporters are? Yeah, I have. Now, remember, when we're talking about, I just have to step back a little bit to pick that apart, just kind of piece that part a little bit to provide some clarification. We, do, we can't bequeath people human beings under wills, okay? You can put what certain preferences are in your will in terms of support. If you're talking about a parent creating a will, that would say who would support my child going forward, but you can't bequeath people, human beings in a will, okay? You can say, okay, but the thing you can do is you can do what's called a letter of intent. And there's some really great examples of a letter of intent mm -hmm. on the ARC of the US's website that talks about how you kind of say, what's gonna happen if I pass? Who's gonna support them? What are the different kinds of roles? That is how parents can plan for the future through a letter of intent. And there's some great models out there about how to do that. A person with a disability can also pick up backup supporters. So um, we regularly do that, just as you can pick up backup agents under a power of attorney. So if I said, if I can't, if my parent, if my dad's unavailable, my si adult sibling will support me. So too, you can do that with supportive decision-making agreements. It just depends upon who is the one creating the document. When we talk about supportive decision-making agreements, who's the person that signs on the dotted line? It's the person with a disability, just as it's the person with a disability who would sign a power of attorney in this kind of situation, an adult with a disability. With a will, you're talking, it's a, it's a different structure. Okay, gotcha, okay. Um, These are really great questions. This is great. <laughs> they are. Um, we had a couple questions that were similar where people really wanted to know specific examples of tools, scenarios, situations, like case studies of, of where supported decision-making um, worked or didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, housing, um, vaccines, someone mentioned even sexual health, like, um, you know, what have you seen in terms of uh, when it really works well and, and when it doesn't work well and sort of, yeah, it, oh, it sounds like, yeah. That's a good question. And absolutely, people want to see examples, right? And that's why I included so many video links. So you could actually hear families talk about how it works. And some of those video links include people who do not speak with words. Some include people who do. I mean, there's a very, a lot of different kinds of links about how it can practically work for people. Um, and uh, some examples of, I think for me about it practically working for people, I have seen people be able to, as they get exposed to using supported decision-making, build their skills over time so that they are able, they weren't able to make a decision even with support at one point in their life. but then later on they are able to do so um, after they've had some exposure to making those kinds of decisions. Um, one example of I've heard when supported decision making unfortunately wasn't the answer had to do with a, a young man who had just turned 18 and um, his mom called me to get guardianship and I met this young man and this young man had a disability, a cognitive disability, but was very um, able to express his wishes, very able to communicate. We met several times, I said, oh, supported decision making, that's gonna be the answer here. Um, you don't need, you know, the guardianship is a necessary supported decision making will work. I also thought he had the capacity to sign a power of attorney if he did want to voluntarily appoint his mom to act for him in certain ways. And I talked to him about supported decision making. He said, no way. I don't want, I want my mom to, you know, just, she can be, I'll do a power of attorney, but I don't want to do supported decision making. And I said, why? And he'd never really been exposed to making decisions himself. And he was frightened about making decisions himself because he hadn't been exposed to it. And this had to do with education. And this was in DC. So for him, it was like, he said, I went to my, I was invited to my first IEPT meeting. They held it on my 18th birthday. What a great gift, right? 18th birthday IEPT meeting. I, I don't, everybody around the table was saying awful things about me. All sorts of things that I couldn't do when I know I can do things. Very demoralizing for this young man. And he said, listen, I'll just let my mom deal with it. I'll just appoint her as my agent. And in that case, I think supported decision-making could have worked if he had had welcoming environments and actually been exposed over his lifetime to those welcoming environments and making decision-making earlier on, right? Leading his own IEP team meeting, or at least a part of his IEP team meeting, instead of it being kind of off a cliff when he turned 18. Um, so those are the set situations I see where supported decision-making hasn't worked as, an, as a kind of concrete example. 
Gotcha. Yep. Those are great. And just to remind everybody what Morgan said, she did include links in the presentation that we'll be sending to you. So um, you'll have a chance to see more concrete examples of sort of the supported decision making model in action. Yes. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple questions for Howard and Adam. Um, somebody commented that, and you even mentioned Howard, um, that Adam has so much support. Like he, he really has quite a network. And um, the question was, did you just research that on your own? Did you have help? How did you um, access all these supports? What was your experience doing that? Um, well, that's a, that's a great question. Adam, Adam is 32. So this is something that developed over time. And as we, as, as we, you know, found out about more things and came across them and, and you know, and, and, it, and it made sense to, uh, to build them in and it seems to work, it seems to work for him. Um, they, they just sort of, it just sort of developed, it just sort of developed over time. Um, Adam, I think you've been seeing the, the, the therapist for, for, since you were 18 or 19, something like that. You have to take yourself off mute. Yeah. I've been seeing the therapist since I was almost, since I was maybe 17 and a half. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that, and then the, the guys group, I think you've done on and off over, over the years, right? You started that many years ago and then you stopped when you were in college and then you resumed yeah. again. And that, yeah. Last year I started doing it with the group. Yeah. And then we, we learned about integrated living opportunities several years ago and, and signed up for that. So it, it kind of developed over time. Right, yeah, it sounds like once you sort of got into the system, uh, other opportunities presented themselves. So that's good. Um, one of the questions uh, in the chat that we just, we have for um, Adam and Howard is, does Adam use a circle of support where all his support people meet on a regular basis to discuss um, issues of importance to you, Adam? Um, or is it, more of a informal, you know, whenever, however things um, play out. Um, and I think we talked about this in our preparation for the webinar too, sort of, do you get everybody together in a room or is it just, you know, sort of talking to everybody at the time you would typically see them? Yeah, well, I do the group sessions on Zoom. Right, so you don't get everybody all in one room in terms of like your dad and your therapist and you know everybody you know in or on Zoom, I, I guess um, you know to talk about like for example your housing decision. I'm guessing you know everybody didn't gather in one place to talk it out with you, right? It was sort of you talk to your respective support people when you yeah. typically yeah. yeah yeah talk to the people you know individually at different times, not everyone all at the same time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sort of more of a natural progression. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much typical for us. We, we don't, I don't know that we're well enough organized to have these big meetings with Robert's rules of order, <laughs> something like that. We just kind of do it in the course of daily life. Well, that makes sense. Um, uh, let's see, another question for Adam and Howard. Um, Adam, do you rely on your sister to make help you make any decisions? Um, and do you see um, a big difference between using your family versus using friends or non-family for helping you with your decisions? So sister and then, um, you know, using family. Um, versus non-family to, to help you out? Well, my, my sister actually was the first person to talk to me about pros and cons of moving to Main Street. I managed to think about some of the pros, which I've agreed with. Some were important and they outweigh the cons. So you weren't annoyed by your sister helping you is what is what the, <laughs> I think is what the question is. You actually, you like talking to your sister about um, this stuff. Well, yeah. Yeah, I also talked to my psychologist after, but, you know, I've enjoyed living at Main Street. So the results were good. That's awesome. Uh, let's see and I thought I was got. lucky to have, you know, got accepted. <laughs> yeah, to Main Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So um, in the interest of full disclosure, Adam's sister, Ilana, is a, is a therapist also, so. Oh, okay, so she's especially helpful, probably. <laughs> okay, got it. She, I think she has her camera on and is just waving to her. Yep, I saw her, yep. <laughs> That's awesome. There she is. All right, let's see what else we got here. Um, I'm just gonna flip back to Morgan for a couple of questions. Um, somebody asked a question, a very specific question about um, how a financial power of attorney, and maybe Howard too, you, you might have even um, encountered this specifically, um, or Adam, how does a financial power of attorney affect a representative payee for SSI? And I don't even know what that is, what that is so. Oh, Morgan, you're on mute. That's a very good question. Okay. Um, so technically, the Social Security Administration does not recognize financial powers of attorney as a way in which an adult person with a disability who receives Social Security benefits, whether it be SSI or SSDI, can voluntarily appoint someone to manage those benefits for them. Um, tech, uh, instead, it, so they're not recognizing a civil right of somebody. And you can tell I'm a little mad about that. Okay. However, um, the way in which if, if, if a person with a disability wa wants their parent or their loved one to manage the social security benefits for them, then that loved one's going to have to apply to be their representative payee. Um, they have to apply with the Social Security Administration um, through an application process. Um, and then the Social Security Administration makes a determination as to, who, as to whether or not to appoint them. You do not need to be a guardian in order to be a representative payee. Um, so that's the, the technical piece of this. Um, the Social Security Administration is going through some reforms to more recognize supported decision making's role. Um, and the fact that somebody should be, even if they can't manage their benefits themselves, they could maybe direct the management of their benefits through voluntary um, approach. But right now, you have to, um, the financial power of attorney is not technically recognized by the Social Security Administration. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to, oh. I just, I hope that was clear. I'm happy to ask, oh, gotcha. answer any questions. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to um, Adam can just, and can I ask oh, a, yeah, go ahead. I just saw one I just wanted to pipe up about because it's near and dear to my heart, guardianship and voting. How does, guardian, how does guardianship yeah, and yeah, yeah. voting? Okay. And I want to share this with you. What a good question because it actually varies across states. In some states, if you have a guardian, you can't vote. And I remember one time being at a presentation um, that I was presenting in Arizona, uh, someone from Arizona came up to me and she said, I got guardianship over my son when he was 18. He's now 30, he's so different. He can do so many things for himself. Um, and I had no idea, he really wants to vote. And I had no idea that in my state, it, he couldn't vote because he was under guardianship. Um, and some states are like that, okay? I'm not saying it's right, and I'm not saying there's not ways to legally challenge that as being unconstitutional, but what I'm saying is that's what their state law says. Now, Maryland is, is not one of those states. Um, in Maryland, um, you're disqualified from voting if you're under guardianship, and the court specifically found that even without accommodation, you cannot, um, you, you don't have any kind of, um, uh, kind of volunteer, you can't vote. Yeah, it has to be a specific kind of court finding um, that would be within the guardianship order. However, if you're contemplating getting guardianship over your adult child and you really want them to make sure that they can still retain the right to vote, I really do advise you to, or this isn't legal advice, but I really do strongly suggest that you, um, you consider bringing it up with the court to make sure there's not an explicit finding and that the person's rights to, um, to vote are protected within the guardianship order. Because you don't, you don't know, you don't know if your child's going to move to a different state. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, you don't, you know, you don't know. And so, if you're really interested in trying to preserve that right and pursue guardianship, you need to be really careful um, to make sure that you're doing that kind of advocacy um, when you seek guardianship. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I did see that one. Um, all right, I'm going to go to one that's more geared toward Adam and Howard. Um, Adam, um, you talked about making your social calendar with your support person. Um, sort of, how, how does that l look? Do you like get all your, is it electronic? Like, do you um, just have like a list of all the stuff that you could do and then your, your support person helps you 
um, figure out what times for what you, to do, or well, how does that process work? Well, I saw the Main Street calendar of activities, and you know, I haven't done much since the pandemic. However, I, I've, I've put information that I'm doing on another calendar. And I sometimes have gotten emails about reminders for things, you know, so that's another helpful thing. So does your, so does the support person, do you just tell him that those things are happening and then you want to sort of plan your week around those things? Or does he also receive those same emails or you pretty much give him the information and then you guys just work out the calendar from there? Well, he saw the calendar for Main Street, but you know, it's, a lot of times stuff happens on the day I that we don't communicate. So yeah, that's why that's why I, I usually pass on telling him. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think you usually um, do most of your own picking, picking, picking right. stuff out yourself. And I think you talk to uh, your mentor about particular things. Um, but for the, but for the most part, you 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 know you set up your own activities and, and sports and, and things you do by yourself. Yeah, I pick what I want to do basically for the most part. Yeah. And do you use um like a like a paper calendar or are you on your phone? Like just how do you what does it look like when you're looking at your calendar? Are you looking on your phone? You looking on your computer? It's actually usually a computer. Okay. That's where I you know type. You know, the, under certain dates when I know I'm doing something, I put in the, you know, times of doing it. But not so much if I, you know, get a, an email about, what, about something that's coming up. Okay, but you prefer not to, like, carry a paper calendar around. You'd rather do it on the computer. Yeah, I don't carry a paper around so much. Yeah. Not I, many people do. I even get text messages about, you know, things coming up. Oh, yep. Yep. Gotcha. All right. Um, this next question sort of combines, a, a, I'm, I'm combining some questions that people had sort of into, into one thing. Um, so in guardianship, there's like one guardian, right? Like that's usually how it works. And then, so is, is there's Sometimes, no Sometimes, not always. Sometimes, oh, not okay. always. So there could be more than one. So the question was, what happens you know, if you are in a supported decision-making model and, um, you know, Adam and Howard, I don't know your entire, you know, family dynamic, but what happens if you have, you know, two parents that, you know, are maybe are divorced, live in different states, um, you know, don't agree. Um, and then there's, but there's no guardianship. And so, you know, nobody can come to an agreement. Like, is it, is it just, I don't know. I guess the question was, you know, getting at, wouldn't it just be easier to get, <laughs> to have one person have the guardianship, you know, so that we can avoid sort of this, you know, rigmarole between parents who may not be on the same page um, regarding the decisions for their, their adult child. Um, I don't know, Morgan, if you've seen any examples of that, but um, that sort of, or Howard, if you've, you've seen anything. Well, I think, I think, talking through what happens when there are disputes between a supporter and the decision maker, it's a very important issue to talk through. Um, I think you need to add, and when, when those kinds of questions come up, you need to really t dive in, why is there a disagreement um, between that, rather than thinking, oh, um, I, I need to overrule that decision. Um, and so I really try, it's a hard, am I saying it's easy? No, it's not. And I'm sure Ad, you know, Adam and Howard can talk maybe about what they do when they have disputes about it, but with supported decision making, it's the, it's the, in this case, a person with a disability who's the final decision maker, and how do supporters support them in a way that makes sure the decisions are as formed as they can be. Um, and I think the other piece I would say to this is that if you were the guardian and you made the decision and overruled, how are you going to make the person follow through with it or do it? So I saw an example, something about what, what if my child drops out of school? I get this question a lot. People are concerned about, you know, people in special education wanting to drop out of school. And if you got a guardianship, and I've had a circumstance like this, if you got a guardianship, how is that going to make the person go to school? Are you going to what call the police and drag them to the school door or drag them to the computer or whatever it is now? Um, that's, you have to ask yourself, why? Why don't they want to stay in school? 
what's wrong with their educational programming. You can have the best IEP in the world. And if, if the person doesn't have buy-in when they're a young adult like that, you're not, it's not going to be worth the paper it's written on. So I think it's really about saying, what's the true core problem here? What's, going, what's wrong with their educational programming that they don't have buy-in for it? That's what I would suggest. But I really welcome hearing from Adam and Howard. How do you guys deal with disputes that come up? Yeah. So, um, Adam gets to decide. So I, you know, like I, like I, like I said uh, earlier, I can, you know, we, we can try and talk him into something. You know, we can try and use whatever parental techniques we have developed over the years, um, and we'll, we'll either succeed or we won't. But 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 that's but that's the way it goes. He he does get to decide, and if and if he makes a decision that we are certain is wrong, we can keep talking about it. But it, it, it really still is it really still is his decision, and and it's not it's really not any different than 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 with a neuro, with with a neurotypical adult, you know. Um, and, and I'll say a, a few words as to a situation where 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 the parents disagree with each other. Um, that's that's just a really difficult situation. It's a difficult situation when when the child is a is 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 a minor. And it's a difficult situation when the child when the child is when the child is an adult. And I, I, if there's a good formula for handling a situation like that, I have not come across it yet. Uh, often you just kind of have to have to muddle through. One, one thing I will say is, if you if you imagine a situation where 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 parents are are, uh, are not living together or are not getting along, I, M M Morgan could certainly speak to this better. That may make it more difficult to have a guardianship. Right, because you know, it, it could be it could be contested. It sort it sort of starts to look like a custody dispute uh, at that point. So there, there there aren't really any great answers when when folks don't get along. Yep, yep, that's true. Um, so we're coming up on eight thirty two p.m. So um, I know we have a lot more questions that we didn't answer, um, Morgan. Can folks email you? Of course. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll put it in the chat box since we don't have the, the slide up, but of course you could email me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about some of these kinds of issues. The one thing I will say, you know, quality trust doesn't represent family members and getting guardianship over people, but we could explore the potential of helping to explore alternatives to guardianship. So that is the one thing I will say um, about that. Um, but I'm happy to be a resource for whoever wants to email me. Great. Thank you so much. Sue, you want to take us out? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Morgan, Adam, and Howard. Um, it was great. You covered a lot of ground and really clarified this topic and shared a lot of really wonderful experiences that, that bring it to life for all of us. So it's really wonderful. Really appreciate it. So everyone that participated today, I hope you found it helpful. Please look for an email from XMinds with a link to the recording and the handouts tomorrow. Um, I'll send it out and that will give you a link to everything we're posting on the um, website. So um, there will also be a short satisfaction survey. Please take a moment to complete it when you get the email tomorrow. Um, we hope to see you back for our next program, which is on Wednesday, December 16th. And that's the one about anxiety. Um, all right, and that's it for now. Many thanks to our panelists, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a good night. Yeah.